thank you to the team of Hormone India uh, for having me for this uh, very interesting uh, session and topic. And I think this is a, uh, you know, looking at the topics uh, through the entire series of program, I think it's a very interesting, uh, you know, conference. And I think, you know, I hope uh, this is done every year because it's really, uh, uh, you know, uh, academically enriching. So I'm going to talk to you about uh, something very important in at present era, and that is next generation sequencing in endocrine. Yes. Now, the advent of next generation sequencing has completely changed the field of genetic medicine and hence will also change the other fields as well. So this is something which brings genetics to the retail level, as we say. Right? For example, you know, uh, there was a time when we used to make a diagnosis of valvular heart disease with a stethoscope. But now uh, even a non-specialist who is not a specialist in cardiology uses an echocardiography to make a diagnosis. And this diagnosis is often very, very accurate. In the same way, the advent of uh, you know, various endocrine investigations uh, at a retail level, at a cheaper level, uh, helped us boom the field of endocrinology. And now even uh, uh, non-specialists can order endocrine investigations uh, and then send it to endocrinologists for the interpretation and the diagnosis. In the same way, genetic medicine has changed completely with the presence of next generation sequencing. And now non-specialists in genetic medicine, like uh, you and me, uh, would be able to make diagnosis of complex genetic disorders uh, with just one blood sample and uh, with, you know, of course, a few, uh, you know, it will require a little bit of uh, investment from the patient and in terms of money. But this is something which is going to change, has already changed our clinical practice, but will play all and more important role in future. So what we're going to do is that we are going to discuss uh, next generation sequencing from the context of an endocrinologist. And that is what we are going to really uh, focus upon. And I'm going to show you a case uh, as an illustration of how an endocrinologist can use the uh, available next generation sequencing technology uh, for the benefit of our patients. So when we talk about diagnosis of any disease, especially in endocrinology, we are talking about three major steps, which you do conventionally. One is the clinical diagnosis. A patient comes with puffiness of face, periorbital edema, pedal edema. You know, you're thinking that patient is probably having an overt hypothyroidism. Then, of course, you do a thyroid function test, which is a biochemical support, right? Which is biochemistry is extremely important for endocrinology, like we all know. We do a thyroid function test and so on. Then you might do a radiological investigation. So these three are the basis of any endocrine investigation, right? Starting from a clinical, biochemical, to a radiological diagnosis. But then in 2022, we have one more step which is involved in the process of the diagnosis, and that is a genetic testing. Right? And this, like I said, is the fourth arm of the clinical diagnosis. And this completes the diagnostic picture. Right? And I'll show you with an illustration of a case how important a genetic testing is. And with several other cases in both adult and pediatric endocrinology where this was very, very useful in our own practice. So let's look at a case. So I think uh, we have a lot of endocrinology uh, students, residents, uh, and also uh, aspiring endocrinologists who are listening to this. So I think this is something which uh, for an endocrinology resident, this is bread and butter. So hence I'll discuss it like a case uh, with what you usually discuss in a ward. So this is a case of an 18 year old male patient who came with absence of secondary sexual characteristics at age of 18. Uh, he also had a younger brother who is 15 years old. And he also has delayed puberty, right? So now your bells are ringing, you're thinking of a particular diagnosis, right? From a clinical point of view, obviously do a clinical examination. There are no facial dysmorphism. There are no midline defects, no cleft palate or cleft lip. Please note these points because these are something which you ask in a patient with delayed puberty, a male with delayed puberty. There is no uh, goiter, no gynecomastia, galactoria, of course, are not relevant here. Hyperpigmentation, no, uh, you know, polytectomy, uh, no inguinal hernia or scars. Now we go to the genital examination. The testicular volume is 2 ml bilaterally. And again, endocrinologists would know that less than 4 ml would suggest that the puberty has not, there's no onset of puberty yet. There are no testicular mass and stretch penile length is suboptimal. So you are dealing with a patient who is having male hypogonadism, which is very clear. And I think, uh, you know, a lot of us would again, we have already started making differential diagnosis in our minds. So very important history is history of anosmia. And the patient has no history of anosmia, no clinical examination, uh, you know, you do a smell test and there is no anosmia. So 
again, you know, we are narrowing a clinical diagnosis to a particular diagnosis, as you'd all say, right? Now, so that was the clinical diagnosis. And now let's talk about the biochemical assessment. So at a biochemical assessment, the important test here would be the gonadotropes, the LH and FSH, and LH is 0 0.03. Remember, uh, an LH of less than 0.1 would suggest that, you know, the pubertal onset is not started. We can clearly see the testosterone levels, which is again uh, in a hypogonadal range. And the other investigations were done uh, just to complete the picture. Right? Uh, of course, we are not going to details of these. We are not going to discuss a hypogonadotropic hypogonadism case here. We are mainly discussing uh, the genetics of it. Uh, the patient's born age was 15 to 16 years. The, we did an MRI. So this is where the radiology support comes. Right, So you have the born age and the uh, you know an MRI, which uh, may be useful in this patient. And the olfactory bulbs are preserved. So this is a patient who is having slight delay in the bone age, but uh, absence uh, uh, with normal pituitary gland and olfactory bulbs preserved. And so you're dealing with a, a hypogonadotropic hypogonadism uh, with a preserved with, without anosmia, with normosmia. So, you know, of course, with the clinical judgment, investigations, uh, biochemical investigations, and uh, the, uh, you know, the uh, radiological investigations, we came up with the diagnosis of what is known as a IHH or CHH, which is idiopathic hypogonadotropic hypogonadism with normosmia. Again, uh, please let's not focus on the diagnosis here. The point is how we look at this early. So now we have the diagnosis in hand, right? And, uh, you know, uh, all endocrinologists would have, would have reached to this diagnosis. But that is where we take the things one step further, right? And then we come to the, the patient also wants to know, and we are also interested in knowing what is the genetic diagnosis. What is the molecular defect, what is the genetic defect which has led to this disease. This is important for one, a, it completes the diagnosis, but it also, you know, we know that there is a very good, strong genotype-phenotype correlation in patients with idiopathic, idiopathic hypogonadotropic hypogonadism. So when we talk about IHH, there are different levels at which genes are involved. So there could be developmental uh, defects in the GNRF neurons, right, which are, you know, you have the Cal1 gene, which is very, very important here. And then you can have EN impaired GNRH secretion, where you have these genes which are involved. Again, you have GNRH resistance, and then you have ultimately gonadotrophic defects. So all of these patients would lead to, uh, would have hypergonadotrophic hypogonadism. But we need to know where our patient stands, right? Where does our patient stand? And based on that, we might be able to, you know, look at more phenotypes, uh, probably, you know, look at uh, the future, uh, you know, genetic counseling also of this patient, depending on the gene which is involved. So now we want to do a genetic test. There are two conventional ways. There are two ways in which we can approach this. You can do something which is known as a conventional Sanger sequencing, or you can do what is now known as a next generation sequencing. So we'll discuss the difference between these two approaches uh, in the next few slides. So conventionally, uh, again, even when I did my own residency, and I did my residency from an area where genetic medicine was very strong. So I think uh, I had we had in fact a posting in genetic medicine also for a few uh, for a month. Uh, which means that, you know, we, where uh, our, our teachers and our, our institute actually saw that genetic medicine was very important for, from an endocrinologist's point of view. So, and even at that time, we used to generally do conventional Sanger sequencing. So, what is Sanger sequencing? So, this is a process of taking one gene at a time, right? So, you're taking, starting with one gene. Uh, obviously, we start with the one with the highest probability. Then we go to the one with low probability. And then you're looking at what is known as a genetic odyssey. So we are looking at one gene at a time, right? So start with one gene. If it's there, fine, no, then move to the next gene, then move to the next gene and so on. Now this is a time consuming and often a frustrating process, but it's also very expensive because each of the Sanger sequence now at current era costs about three to 5,000 rupees. At that point of time, when I was, doing, I was doing my residency, it would cost around eight to nine, eight, 8,000 to 10,000 rupees. So you are talking at, if you're looking at multiple genes, we are talking at about a uh, uh, investment cost about 50, 60,000 rupees, which obviously all our patients would not be able to afford. Uh, again, this process is also time consuming and often frustrating because you are then looking at one gene. If it if it works fine, if it doesn't, you know, move to the next gene and so on. Right. So that is what conventionally Sanger sequencing used to do. But now we have moved to you know what is known as a next generation sequencing. So if you let's say this patient, we have made a clinical diagnosis of IHH with normosmia. And as an endocrinologist, you know that these are the genes which are involved in this process. So you have, you know, the GNRH uh, uh, receptor and GNRH gene, which is involved. You have the KISS uh, uh, receptor and the KISS1 gene involved. And you have the TAC3 and TAC3 receptor, which are involved. So we'll have to check each of this. There are six genes involved here, 
and we have to check each of these genes uh, for the uh, clinical diagnosis. Uh, and hence, you know, if you say, let's say, uh, you take a chart cost of about, uh, you know, 6,000 rupees for each of the gene, you know, you're looking at a cost which is an upward of 36,000, 40,000 rupees. So that, that makes it not only time consuming, but also very expensive. And it could so happen that all of these genes are negative. And sometimes we know that sometimes a, even a Cal1 or other genetic mutations may have normosmia or may have hyposmia, which is often thought to be normosmia. And in such cases, again, you will have to look at other set of investigations uh, once again. So hence, you know, it is perhaps a good idea to consider doing what is known as a next generation sequencing. So in next generation sequencing, we look at uh, multiple genes in parallel instead of one gene at a time. So what we're doing with Sanger sequencing was uh, a stepwise process where you are looking at sequential, looking at genes. But in a next generation sequencing, you are doing something in parallel, right? You're looking at multiple genes uh, in the same time. So that is what makes the difference in terms of the diagnosis. It, it gives you a, a rapid checking of multiple genes. And then now you're looking at a panel of genes instead of a single gene at a time. So looking at a complete panel, and then your diagnostic yield will also be much, much higher. So we need to understand there are certain terminologies which are related to next generation sequencing. We'll see what is NGS as well, but we'll also see there are certain terms which, again, all of the endocrinologists and definitely, uh, you know, of other special, uh, you know, doctors of other specialty also need to understand. So you have, first of all, what is known as a whole genome sequencing, where you, you know, sequence the entire human genome. Now, this is mainly experimental. This is very little clinical use. There's no point of checking the entire human genome. But just to tell you, uh, after the completion of human genome project, now you have a library of all the genes, of the, all the human genes. And the cost of uh, sequencing the entire genome used to be very expensive in the past. It has come down to uh, you know, a manageable uh, range. But we are smarter. We, we are, you know, of course, being doctors, we do not want to just you know, blindly check the entire genome because it makes no sense for us. You are dealing with a disease-specific genetic problem and you are not dealing with the entire human genome. You don't want to look at the entire human genome. So we look at, then we move said, why don't we just check the exome, right? Exome, remember, uh, exons are the coding regions and exome is the entire coding sequence uh, of the human DNA. So we are now then checking only the whole exome, right? So we do this through a whole exome sequencing. We are looking at only at the coding regions. So that is what is known as the whole exome sequencing. So in the West, whole exome sequencing is popular. But uh, in India, again, we are probably even smarter than people at the West. We know that. We do what is known as a clinical exome sequencing or what is also known as targeted sequencing. So now I am dealing with a patient who is having idiopathic hypogonadotropic hypogonadism. I am not dealing with other disorders. So I'm not interested in what are the other genes involved, uh, which are coincidental, which may not be related with this, this patient at all. So we are now, right now, interested only in the uh, disease-specific uh, genetic testing. And hence, we are looking at a clinical exome sequencing. So we are then only looking at disease-specific genes which are sequenced. So panel of disease-specific genes which are sequenced. Of course, you can broaden the range, but then you are not dealing with you know, cancer genes. You are not dealing with other genes which are which have little relevance to this patient. Maybe it is relevant to other patients, but for this patient, it is not relevant. So we are looking at mainly at the targeted gene sequencing, which is also known as clinical exome sequencing. And this is what we practice in clinical medicine right now. So like I said, what has been brought to the retail level is the clinical exome sequencing. And clinical exome sequencing, which is a form of next generation sequencing, has completely changed our clinical practice for good. So you know, broadly in terms of difference between a whole exome and clinical exome sequencing, whole exome sequencing would require coding at a larger region. We are looking at about 20,000 genes. Here we are looking only at three to 6,000 genes. Even lesser, if you have, uh, you know, your clinical diagnosis is more accurate. Uh, it requires, you know, a, a whole exome sequencing cost about uh, fifty to sixty thousand, whereas a clinical exome sequencing can be done for thirty to forty thousand. In fact, now a lot of labs also do it for twenty to thirty thousand, right? So that that cost is much much lower. Uh, you know, whole exome sequencing is done more in the West, but in India and developing countries, uh, clinical exome sequencing is more popular, right? Remember, the amount of data which is generated from whole exome sequencing is also larger and you require a lot more time. So the uh, you know, turnaround time is also larger with the whole exome sequencing compared to a clinical exome sequencing. So let's be smarter and focus our tests on clinical exome sequencing. At least we are, you know, uh, we may not be experts in genetics, but we are experts in endocrinology. Hence, we are able to narrow down a list of genes which you can probably sequence in parallel and hence reduce the cost.
So what exactly is next generation, uh, next generation sequencing NGS and what are the steps involved in the process of NGS? So the first step of this obviously starts with the sample. Right? So you take the uh, DNA sample of the patient, you extract the genomic DNA. Then remember, you want to sequence things in parallel, right? Now, when you have a, such a large human genome, remember the human genome is a large set of genes. So what initially is done is that you break this gene into smaller segments, which are much more easier to really uh, test or really look at, right? So uh, to sequence an entire genome will take a lot of time. So you sequence parts of the genome. So you break the genes into particular segments. And then each of these segments is amplified using PCR. We, are, we all know what is PCR now, right? So in the era of COVID, I think everybody, even uh, lay people know what PCR is. So then you do a PCR. With the PCR, you, you uh, multiply the relevant uh, you know, areas. And then you do what is known as a sequencing, right? So sequencing, what you typically do is that, remember, you know, you have the complementary base pairs, right? Uh, so you label the complementary, uh, you know, you have the, uh, you know, labeled complementary pair, and then that is how, uh, you know, uh, match with the area of interest that is the, you know, amplified uh, DNA segment. And then, you know, once it completes, you know, once there is joining of the uh, complementary segments, it will uh, give out the signal, and the signal with this will be able to sequence the uh, the segment which you are looking at, right? So that's how the sequencing is done. Uh, but the, uh, you know, entire story does not end there because then the major part really comes is the bioinformatics analysis. So now you have sequencing of the segment which is done. So you're looking at, remember, you're doing a clinical exome sequencing. So you're looking at the relevant areas of the DNA. Uh, and these areas now you, you have uh, sequenced. But so it's like, you know, doing the blood test. So you're done the TSH right? But now you need to interpret the TSS value. And that is where bioinformatics analysis comes into picture. So here, what is done is that you look at the data, you look at the sequence data, you compare it with the existing library of the human genome. And then you look at the variations which are there in, in that segment. So that is where you look at. Remember, there's a huge amount of data which is generated. The larger areas of the DNA you are sequencing, the more data it will be generated. So uh, again, this is the major part. Uh, of the entire process. This is where the genetic medicine expert really comes into picture. Just like an endocrinologist, uh, a TSS can be ordered by any doctor, but you'll require an expert to really make the fine tune and the, uh, you know, the important genetic analysis here. And that is where you have the clinician and the geneticist who come together to make the correct diagnosis. So the more information you give to a geneticist, the better they'll be able to give you a bioinformatics analysis and give you a better diagnosis. So these are the steps which are involved in NGS. Remember, this is where we have the involvement of big data and, you know, the all these machine learning and the uh, artificial intelligence and the big data, all these things are very, very important for bioinformatics analysis. They are just, you know, a buzzwords in other specialties, but they are now day-to-day -day practice in bioinformatics. So these are the steps which are involved in a next generation sequencing. Then, of course, there are, uh, you know, certain uh, variations of next generation sequencing. You have short read and long read sequence. So depending on the platform you're using, uh, you might have a short read or long read sequencing methods. In short reads, you're basically looking at limited, a leading limited base pairs. So at a single point of time, able to read limited base pairs. So for a genome which is very large, like the human genome, uh, the you know you need to break the genome into multiple segment, and then you need to read it by the platform. Whereas in a long read sequencing, you can sequence larger areas uh, and more base pairs. So again, you know that makes the pro output faster and the entire turnaround time faster. But the, catch is that the errors are more in terms of long read sequencing, whereas errors are less with short read sequencing. So in India, uh, and of course, in most of the Asian countries where we generally do our clinical exome sequencing, we are generally looking at short read uh, you know, platforms where you're looking at the relevant areas and you're not looking at the entire human genome. So if you're looking at a research uh, process where you're looking at the entire human genome or the entire whole exome, perhaps a long read sequence analysis would be better. But in our practice, where you're mainly looking at clinical exome sequencing, you're mainly looking at short reads. Then, of course, there are other pitfalls with NGS. So NGS has trouble detecting short repeated sequence, like, for example, CAG repeats, which you see in fragile X syndrome. So you're thinking of a diagnosis of fragile X syndrome, or you're looking at, remember, you, you know, uh, in patients with uh, POI, you're looking at whether they are carrier, these women are carrier for fragile X. In such cases, sort of time, so, sorry, sir. Yeah, yeah I'll quickly, I'll, I, I'm out finished. Right? So in such, such cases, we are looking at Sanger sequencing may be better. And those mutations which are more than 25 base pairs away from the exon, this may be best. So again, you are looking at, uh, you know, these are often the pitfalls. Uh, 
So uh, I'll just end with the last few slides. So we are coming back to the case, right? So we did a, a whole uh, clinical exome sequencing for this patient, and we found that this patient had TAC R3 mutation, uh, which is again uh, consistent with the diagnosis we are making. So it is hypogonadotropic hypogonadism with anosmia, and this was autosomal recessive, right? So a lot of these these are disorders are X-linked. This is autosomal recessive. So that that makes it an important clinically relevant uh, uh, problem that we are solving. So the idea here is that with the next generation sequencing, we completed the clinical diagnosis uh, from a clinical diagnosis to a biochemical to the radiological to the genetic diagnosis. Uh, you know, where do you use NGS in endocrinology in other cases, for example, metabolic bone disease, where we are, I think, you know, a lot of talk is going to be here today, uh, IHH, uh, CAH. You're looking at endocrine oncology, where it's very, very important, monogenic diabetes, monogenic and syndromic obesity. I think that makes the you know, guesswork out of it, you know, with just the whole exome sequencing, you're able to make a diagnosis, uh, pituitary disorder, short stitcher, and so on, right? So I just quickly show you some of our other cases, uh, you know, which I could just collect a few cases uh, yesterday uh, of where we did whole exome sequencing. This is a patient who had a family history of sudden cardiac death with listopolemia. We did a clinical exome sequencing looking at cardiovascular risk. This patient uh, turned out to have iris-1 gene defect, which is, uh, you know, makes her susceptible to type 2 diabetes. She also had Ethmogenic right ventricular dysplasia gene, gene which is autosomal dominant, uh, and perhaps this contributed to the sudden cardiac deaths in the family. Uh, we had this child who presented with short stature, where we found this had, had uh, you know GHR uh, GH receptor uh, defect, where we had you know uh, Laird syndrome was diagnosed. Uh, we had this patient, a young doctor, where we had you know patient had pituitary involvement, she had a uh, you know pituitary uh, prolactinoma, and she also had uh, hyperparathyroidism. So we're looking at MEN1 syndrome. We did the genetic testing. Interestingly, we did the testing for the whole family, and she was the only one uh, in the family with this uh, genetic defect. Uh, we had this patient with CH, uh, where you know we sent the uh, you know a clinical exome sequencing. Uh, so these are some of the illustrative cases. So these are cases where you can use this in clinical practice. So I thank you for a patient listing. And uh, as introduced, you know we have this notes in endocrinology app. Uh, which is very useful for endocrinologists when anybody it's free of cost, you know, you can probably uh, download this and look at this. Uh, we also have this Centurion insulin app, which is uh, mainly targeted at physicians and, uh, you know, uh, doctors who are interested in diabetes practice, uh, where we are, you know, uh, telling you when to start insulin, what dose to start, what type of insulin to start and so on. And of course, you know, this is a hypothetical, this is recently launched, this is currently available right now in the, uh, you know, just a few weeks back, we are able to put this on the iOS and the, uh, you know, both the platforms. Uh, and this is hypothyroidism in pregnancy for doctors. This is useful for both for physicians, endocrinologists, and uh, OBGYN for, uh, you know, uh, when to treat and when not to treat hypothyroidism in pregnancy. So this is uh, what I have to deliberate today. So thank you for a patient listening and apologize if I short the time. Sorry.